Open your Bibles this morning to Joshua chapter 24. We've got a few stops in our journey this morning for our Father's Day message. And we'll look at verses 14 to 15 and a rather a famous statement in verse 15. But today is Father's Day and there are many things that dad, dads are famous or maybe even notorious for. They're being known for. One of them, and I'm sure some of you have been seeing uh, them floating around on social media, and dads are known for bad dad jokes. And I ran across a few classics the other day that I thought would launch us into our time in a rather fitting way this Father's Day Sunday morning. Now, one of the ones, and I have to admit, over the years, I have said it myself, one of the famous dad statements is, did you get a haircut? No, I got them all cut. <laughs> Groaners, obviously. Another bad dad joke. How do you get a squirrel to like you? You act like a nut. <laughs> this one I'd never heard, but it's uh, quickly becoming a classic. Why don't eggs tell jokes? Because they'd crack each other up. <laughs> I like this one too. What do you call someone with no body and no nose? Nobody knows. <laughs> They're groaners, I know. Uh, here's one I like too. How do you make a Kleenex, Kleenex dance? You put a little boogie in it. <laughs> My dad was a lover of humor of all kinds but especially the high-minded, refined humor of a group called the Three Stooges. And uh, we would laugh together and watch those things together. And I knew my dad's love of dumb jokes. And one time I called and I wanted to tell him this. I knew he'd get a kick out of it. And to be honest with you, I hadn't heard my dad laugh so long and so hard at a joke as this one when I told him. And it's a major groaner, so I'm telling you in advance. And what I called and told my dad was this. A three-legged dog walked into a saloon and the barkeep said, can I help you, stranger? And the three-legged dog said, I'm looking for the man who shot my paw. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> my dad was a legend in our family for many things. Uh, my dad was a man who'd share his faith with anybody and everybody. All he talked about was Jesus everywhere he went. He'd get pulled over and he'd tell the CHP about Jesus. He'd talk about Jesus at work. But he was also famous for his campfire starting abilities. And for my dad, anybody can light a fire, fire with lighter fluid. But if you want to get things going in a hurry, you use gasoline. <laughs> and my dad could start a fire. And he could start a rager Instead of uh, in a few seconds, he could start it instantly. Now, it wasn't necessarily a concern whether it stayed in the confines of the fire ring because the control burn wasn't what he was really after. It was the ignition speed that counted, how fast we got the fire going. And I have to say, he passed this on to his only son. <laughs> and I have scared, or maybe I should say I've scarred my own family with some of my antics with the fireplace and beyond. One year, I hate to admit this, but I didn't want to drag the Christmas tree out to the curb so the trash man could hire it away. So I cut it up in three pieces and threw it in the fireplace and lit it on fire. And we found out how pine needles will burn quickly and potentially even burn your house down in just a matter of seconds right after Christmas. So we are all, as dads, known for certain things. But here's something I think we need to remember this Father's Day morning. In James 5, 17 verse, uh, through 18, we're told Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, we as men are all distinct from one another. We are distinct physically in our makeup. We are distinct mentally, we are even distinct emotionally, but the common feature all men share is that we have a nature like that of Elijah. And he was known to call down fire too, but in a different way than my dad and myself. But he was a man of power. 
who knew of and walked in the power of prayer. Now, I am sure there are other men and dads who have their own level of fame, so to speak. But this morning, I want to talk to all the men about the one reputation that we should all share as sons of the Most High God and what our reputation should be. And that is we should be known as, and here's our title, men of faith and power. We should be known as men of faith and power. Now, as we did on Mother's Day, when we looked at warrior women of God, so too, I don't want to just address the men today as we didn't just address the mothers on Mother's Day, but I want to talk to all the men this morning because there are some lessons for us all in such a time as this. And I'll remind you of the profoundly striking statement I made on Mother's Day that not all women are moms, but all women are women. Somebody say amen. So too is it true this morning that not all men are dads, but all men are male. And even in this gender dysphoric age that we live in, listen, if you are genetically a male, you are a male. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, the men we're going to look at as examples of faith and power are Joshua, David, and Daniel. Now, Joshua and David were both military men. Daniel was a diplomat in a sense, and that itself tells us that men of faith and power are to have an influence on their nation and people. Daniel was technically a slave, but like Joseph, he had power and influence over the ruler of the then known pagan world, much as Joseph was second in command to Pharaoh himself over the kingdom of Egypt, so too Daniel was the counselor to kings. Now in Leviticus 26, 8 and 9, speaking of the nation of Israel, the children of God, five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you, for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. And listen, I read that for this reason. The men of faith and power in this world, by comparison, are relatively few in number when you consider the whole of the world and how many do not recognize God, how many do not believe in or obey God. And we need to remember that God has a pattern and a preference to use a few to put tens of thousands to flight that he might receive glory and honor for what he has done through a few good men and women. So let's look at three men from history and find our reminders this Father's Day that we are commissioned and called by God to be men of faith and power. Are you ready this morning, guys? Yes. Ladies, you're coming too, so you can say yes as well. So please stand and read with me from Joshua chapter 24, verses 15, 14 and 15, and we'll start our journey there this morning. Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers uh, served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, we make that declaration in your house here today, that we are your servants. We are here to serve, please, and honor you. And Lord, I pray for and over your men this morning that you would strengthen us by your word. We thank you that it does not return void. Strengthen your daughters in the room as well this morning for life in such a time as this. Remind us of who we are in Christ Jesus and that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us this day. So we thank you, Lord, for your word. Speak through it and to us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is the farewell address of Joshua, his parting words, so to speak, prior to his death to the nation of Israel. His former position was he was the field general for the great man Moses. And upon Moses' death, God called and anointed Joshua 
as his replacement. Now, he began his farewell address by recounting the history of the nation, going all the way back to Abram and the birth of Isaac. And he reminded them of the great and mighty works that the Lord had done in Israel's history. He started when Abram was called from the other side of the river out of Ur of the Chaldees to come out and be separate from his people, even as we as Christians have been called to come out and be separate from the world. He was telling them and reminding them of the miraculous birth of Isaac through the plagues of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the miracles that God had done, the conquest of Jericho, other military victories the Lord had won through them. And after verses 14 and 15 that we just read, Joshua went on and said this to the nation. But Joshua said to the people in 19, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. In other words, he will not accept the worship of other things or people. He will not forgive the tra your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good for you. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, read this out loud with me, please. The Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Now, Joshua didn't just make his famous statement in verse 15 and leave it hanging there. He threw down the gauntlet to the nation. He told Israel, you cannot serve God and be an idolater at the same time. You cannot serve God and live for the world. He said, put away the foreign gods which are among you. Turn your heart or incline your heart towards the Lord. In other words, Joshua wasn't trying to throw out some kind of catchphrase that others would quote behind him. He was a man of faith and power who told it like it was no matter what other people were doing. We need such men today. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, that gives us the first of our three considerations this morning, this Father's Day, this day where we recognize the calling of God on the life of his men. And that's just this. Here we go. Listen up, men. A man of faith and power doesn't go with the flow. He determines it. A man of faith and power doesn't go with the flow. He determines it. Joshua said to Israel, I can tell you what direction my house is going in. And the people said, we're going that way too. Joshua said, no, you're not. You can't call living in idolatry serving the Lord. And then he said, get rid of the idols. And the people said to Joshua in response, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. Joshua didn't go with the flow. Joshua determined the direction for his own house. He challenged others to go in that same direction. And one more thing about Joshua and why he's one of those that when we arrive in heaven, I would like to chat with someday. I would like to ask Joshua, what was it like when you gave the briefing to your leaders and told them the plan about taking Jericho? You who had led these great battles against the enemies of Israel, what did your commanders say when you told them we're going to march around for six days in silence. Seventh day, we're going to march around seven times. Here's how we're going to take the city. We're going to yell and blow trumpets. I mean, imagine the looks on the faces of those who had seen Joshua be valiant in battle. But one of the things I love about Joshua, we find from Joshua chapter 9. He had conquered Jericho through very... Uh, distinct means from previous battles, as we said a moment ago. They had already taken Ai after a prayerless failure on their part, which cost the lives of some 36 Israelites. And after this, a group of Gibeonites came to Joshua, and they came to him with worn-out sandals. Their clothes were dirty and dusty, and they presented to him moldy bread and said, you know, we've come from a long way because we've, we've heard of the nation of Israel and the God of Israel 
And therefore, we wanted to come and make a covenant with you. We don't look, dwell inside the land that God has given you. But this evidence tells you that we've lived uh, a long way away. And they tricked Joshua. And they tricked him into making a covenant with them so Israel wouldn't fight against them and destroy them. And after three days, Joshua and the rulers of Israel found out what the Gibeonites had done and how they had deceived him. Now in Joshua 9, 19 to 21, we're told then, all the rulers said to the congregation, all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. And the ruler said to them, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation as the rulers had promised them. Now, after this happened, the very next chapter, chapter 10 tells us that five Amorite kings heard about the covenant that the Gibeonites had made with the nation of Israel. So they sought to disrupt and destroy this relationship before it really got off the ground. And these five Amorite kings decided to attack Gibeon. And the Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in Gilgal to come and help them. Now in Joshua 10, 7 through 10, we're told that Joshua, what's the next word? Joshua what? Ascended from Gilgal. He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, the five Amorite kings, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched for how long? All night. From where? Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Now, here's what you need to know, and here's why we paused on certain words and phrases. The children of Israel were camped in Gilgal. Gilgal was 1,300 feet below sea level. Gibeon was 40 miles away at the elevation of 3,700 feet above sea level. Now listen close, men, ladies. That meant Joshua and the mighty men of Israel marched all night, gaining an elevation some 5,000 feet to defend a group of liars, deceivers, and manipulators. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like the Great Commission. We are to go to a world that is filled with liars, deceivers, manipulators, adulterers, and seek to save them from the enemy who wants to destroy them. And Joshua marched all night uphill for people who had deceived him. Now listen this morning. Listen, are you here? We don't march with the fallen. We march to the fallen to tell them about Jesus. And men of faith and power don't go with the flow. They determine the flow. And listen, we need to be as Joshua and company today and go out and rescue those who are filled with the deception of the lying enemy, the father of all lies, Satan himself. And it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they've done. God loves them. God wants to save them. And he wants to use us to reach them. Even after we have to march 40 miles uphill all night, just to get to where they are. This is what God wants to do with men of faith and power. Now, as we move on to David as our next example, there are a myriad of choices from his life experiences that we could select this morning and use for our time and topic. But I want to look at one that was close to the incident that he's most famous for, and that is the battle with Goliath or Goliath. And it shows us what a young man on fire for God can be and do, which would ultimately lead to that famous encounter. Now, David's father, Jesse, had three sons in the military, and he sent David to the hilltop that overlooked the Valley of Elah, where the famous battle between David and Goliath would shortly take place, and he sent him with provisions for his sons to see how the battle against the arch enemy of Israel, the Philistines, was going. Now, the story tells us this from 1 Samuel 17, 20 to 29. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out 
to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines and spoke according to the same words. They'd been previously reported in 1 Samuel 17. So David heard them and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, what did they do? They fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give his house, uh, father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done. In other words, what they just said, that's what's going to happen for the man who kills Goliath. Now, Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Now we have to remember at this point in time, all of Jesse's sons had been brought before Samuel to see who the Lord had choice, chosen to replace Saul. Eliab was the biggest. He was the oldest. He was the handsomest, but he was not the man after God's own heart. And based on David's comment, what have I done now? It seems Eliab was often critical of his youngest brother, David, as evidenced by his demeaning statements about David's character and abilities. Oh, where's those few sheep that you watch over? What are you doing down here, you prideful little brat? Oh, you came down here with just to see the battle and go home and tell dad what's going on here. And it was David's reply to Eliab's barbs that makes him a candidate for our subject today, where David says, is there not a cause? And the cause in David's mind was an uncircumcised Philistine was defying the armies of the living God, and thus he was defying God himself. Now, a good reminder for us comes from Judges 16, verse 23, where we're told that the lords of the Philistines had gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our, destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. Now, the reason this is important is because it was Eli who replaced Samson as judge over Israel, and Samuel served under Eli and eventually replaced him, and Samuel was the one who selected or uh, identified David as the chosen of God to be king over Israel. So the point is this, the story of Samson was not ancient history to David. It was well known to him and certainly was something that was spoken of in the nation of Israel to that very day. And therefore, it's not a stretch at all to assume that David knew of the events that followed the capture of Samson and how Judges tells us that Samson killed more Philistines when he died than he had his whole life. And David had to be thinking, here these people are again. Here these Philistines are again, thinking that their God, Dagon, is a match for the almighty God, Jehovah, El Elyon, God most high, the God of the nation of Israel, the true and living God. And in David's mind, he's saying, how dare they defy the armies of the living God? Now, here's what we can learn from David, the shepherd boy before he was king. Listen, men of faith and power live to honor God, not please the world. Men of faith and power live to honor God, not please the world. Now, I like it that David said, what do you get for killing this guy? He already saw the job was done. He was wanting to know what was going to be his. He knew that he was going to take out Goliath. 
And he knew that God had called him to do so. He wasn't out to impress the Philistines. He wasn't out as he was accused by his own brother to impress the Israelite soldiers. He was undaunted by Eliab's insults. His first concern was that the armies of the living God were being belittled and that the Philistines would have the opportunity to go right back to saying what they said after Samson's death. Our God has delivered us and we have defeated Israel's champion. And David was having none of it. Now, in 1 Samuel 17, 42 to 46, the famous scene, we're told when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And what he was referring to is that the sling that David would use was two sticks with a leather strap between, and he would swing them around release one of the sticks and thus releasing the stone that was inside to make its way to the target. And the Philistine, Goliath says, what do you come out to play with a dog with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to Goliath, I'm sorry, Mr. Goliath. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm going to go back and sit with the army and to mind my own business from now on. Is that what he said? David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth, here's David's motivation, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He didn't say that all the earth may know that I am the man after God's own heart. He didn't say that all the earth may know that I'm Saul's replacement and God chose me as king. His concern was the name of the true and living God. And Goliath is insulted that Israel would send out a teenage boy to face him. But what he didn't realize is that was the last human he was ever going to see. And David says, you bring all these weapons out here, but the weapon I have is greater than anything that you carry because I come to face you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of army, the armies of Israel, who will deliver you and will deliver your army into my hands that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Listen, David didn't care what Eliab thought. David didn't care what Saul said when Saul said, you can't fight this guy. David didn't care what Goliath had. All he cared about was that the name of the Lord was being defied and he had to do something about it. Men, we have to do something about it today. Men were at war. Ladies were at war. The God of the living and the God of this world are at war. And listen, Satan has convinced the masses in our day with the greatest crime in human history, and that is that inside a pregnant woman is a blob of tissue that can be disposed of at will. And I wonder what would happen today if men of faith and power began to stand in front of the abortion clinics instead of the women's Bible studies from around the country and tell these young women that God loves them and he loves the child inside of them. Listen, I wonder what would happen in our country if men of faith and power began to infiltrate the many juvenile facilities that are packed with fatherless young men and tell them we've come here to defy the enemy of life. We've come here to fight for you. We've come here to tell you God loves you. We've come here to defeat the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. I wonder what would happen if men stood up like this in this day. Men of faith and power are God honorers, not man pleasers. We don't go with the flow. We determine it. And Joshua did it. David did it even as a boy, and we should do it as God's men 
today. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Listen, the devil is no match for a man of God. He and his minions are powerless against us. He can seek to oppress us. He can harass us, but he can't have us and he can't defeat us because God is with us. I better move on before I get excited. <laughs> one last example from one of the great men of Scripture, another favorite of us all, a man named Daniel. A little background regarding Daniel, at least for our purposes this morning. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him. And he knew that most of the wise men were actually wise guys. They really didn't have any answers. They're just a bunch of con men who would tell the king what he wanted to hear. But this dream in particular really bothered him, and he wanted to know what it was, and he didn't want to be conned by this group who would always, as yes men, tell him what he wanted to hear. So instead of telling them the dream, he said, you know what, I know that you'd make something up, so I'm not going to tell you the dream. If you are who you really claim to be, then you'll know the dream, and you can tell me the dream, and then I'll believe your interpretation. Now listen to what they said back to the king. They said to the king, nobody can do that. It's impossible. Nobody can interpret the dream. Give you the dream and then interpret the dream. Can't be done. So the king got mad and he gave a decree to start killing the wise men. And they went looking for Daniel and his friends because they were on that list. And here's what happened next. In Daniel 2, 14 to 19, we're told then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon, he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked who? The king, King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the then known world. He asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house, made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel what? He blessed the God of heaven. Now, listen. History tells us that Daniel and his friends likely the sons of the aristocracy of Jerusalem, because they were the best and brightest of Israeli society, were carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon in 605 BC. Now the boys were teenagers at this time because we know Daniel served under four kings and two kingdoms. He served until his death sometime in the 530s BC, which meant when Daniel died, he was late 80s, perhaps early 90s. Thus, he had to be 16 or 17, when he was carried away captive. History also tells us that the dream Nebuchadnezzar had happened in 603 BC. Now that meant that Daniel was no older than 20, perhaps even as young as 18 or 19 when this event occurred. Yet, he has the respect to the captain of the king's guard to ask him why the king's command was so urgent, and the captain respected him enough to allow him an audience with the king himself, Nebuchadnezzar, which could have been viewed by the king as blatant disobedience to a direct order and could have cost Arioch his life for disobeying the king. Yet, Daniel, as a teenager at the oldest, 20 years old, has commanded such respect by his actions that Arioch takes him in to see the most powerful man in the world. Now, this is important to our point, but it also reminds us that God has a plan and purpose for young men and women. And he has been using men like Joseph, who, like Daniel, was probably 17 when he was sold as a slave, and he wound up the second most powerful man in the world. Daniel, same age. Mary, many scholars believe she was between 15 and 17 years old when she gave birth to Jesus and became blessed among women. So the king has a dream. The wise men of the world couldn't answer it. Now listen, later around 566 or 7 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream 
that Daniel says the magicians, the astrologers, the soothsayers, and the Chaldeans could not interpret it. But again, God interpreted it through Daniel. Still later in 439 BC, Belshazzar has a party. He takes the temple vessels that his grandfather had taken away from Jerusalem in the temple when he destroyed it. And he drank in this party for a thousand of his lords out of these vessels that were dedicated and consecrated to service and worship of God. A hand appears, writes a message on the wall, which again, this same group is unable to interpret. So guess who Belshazzar sends for? Who? Daniel. Then Daniel 5, 13 to 16 says, Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. I have heard of you that the spirit of God is in you. That's what should be the first thing that's remembered or recognized about us. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, Belshazzar says, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. Did Daniel? Yes, he did. Now, Here's a few things to make note of from Daniel overall that will make our last point this Father's Day Sunday. I want you to think about this. As a teenager, Daniel was the only one who could go to the king and ask for time to get the interpretation. In their late 20s, possibly early 30s, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the only three people in all of Babylon who will not bow down signaling through the music that it was time to worship the statue made of Nebuchadnezzar. In his 50s, Daniel is the only one in the kingdom who can interpret Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. In his 60s, Daniel is the only man who can interpret the handwriting on the wall for Belshazzar. In his 70s, Daniel is the only man in the Medo-Persian Empire to disobey the king's edict that no one could be prayed to except for the king himself for 30 days. And when Daniel knew the edict was signed, he went home and as was his custom since his early days, he threw open the windows of his upper room and he prayed toward Jerusalem and wound up in the lion's den for doing so. Now, what does that tell us as men today? Just this, men of faith and power, have supernatural boldness, wisdom, and insight. <clears throat> Men of faith and power have supernatural boldness, wisdom, and insight. Now, I'm not sure why I haven't heard any testosterone-based amens after that point, but I'll let you slide on that. Do I need to say that again, guys? Men of faith and power have supernatural boldness, wisdom, and insight. Now, that doesn't mean we're smarter than everybody else because there are smart people in the world. But listen this morning, there's a huge difference in being smart and being wise. And God's men are wise. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There's loads of smart people in the world who don't fear the Lord and thus they don't have wisdom in the things that matter the most. Listen, if you're a man of God who knows the word, you're a man with answers. You're a man with insight. You know how life began. You know the purpose and meaning of life. You know the future. And you know how things will end because the word of God has told us all these things. And the Marines had a commercial for a while that said, we're looking for a few good men. Well, God says, I'm looking for men made good through Jesus Christ. Men of faith and power. Men who I can make bold with supernatural wisdom and insight. Men who have answers to the things of life, answers that can only be found in the word of God and men who are empowered by the spirit of the living God. Men who live to honor God and not please men. Men who don't go with the flow, men who determine the flow. Men who stand, men who stand alone when necessary and men who bow to no one but the Lord. Listen, we've had so many things 
going on in our world today. So many things that are not what God has ordained for us to do. Listen, let me just say what I just said a moment ago one more time. We don't bow to anybody except for Jesus. We have pastors and church leaders bowing before other human beings today. When the fact is, John the Beloved, who walked with Jesus for his whole ministry, who lived longer than any other disciple, was overwhelmed in a moment in a heavenly scene, and he fell down and bowed before another human. And that man said, see that you do not do that. Worship God. We don't bow before humans. We don't bow before other people. We bow only before the true and living God before whom someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. I don't know. This all sounds like man stuff to me. I like it. I don't know why it came to me, but it hit me at the end of last service. Some of you, I know there's a new, a new brand. Boxing has been kind of replaced with all the MMA stuff and all that. But, you know, I grew up in my house. We watched boxing. And I grew up watching boxing with my dad. My family and I watched boxing. I went to many of the closed circuit broadcasts of Muhammad Ali fights and some of the other things that were big in the day. And uh, so I kind of, once in a while, I go back and I watch on YouTube some of the great fights. Some of you guys that have been around a while like me might remember the Hearns Hagler fights and some of these other great fights of the past. And, you know, as Muhammad Ali got older and uh, his magnificent uh, foot speed and hand speed uh, maintained its level, but maybe lost a little bit, he, he started doing something that used to make a lot of people mad, and I was one of them. He started doing this thing called rope a dope. And he would just lean up against the ropes and he would put his gloves in front of his face and his arms in front of his body, and he would just deflect punches. And he would do that sometimes for two minutes of a round, maybe two and a half minutes of the round. But then at the end of the fight, he would come out and throw nonstop punches for 30 to 45 seconds, and he'd steal the round and win the fight. The church has been doing rope-a-dope long enough. It's time to come out swinging. It's time for us to steal the round. It's time for us to stand up and fight. Listen, we're getting pushed around. Do you know that the city of San Diego declared that you cannot have company in your house ever for any reason? You can't have company if you live in San Diego County. You can't have your family over. You can't have your friends over. Well, you know what's coming after that? If you can't meet in your house, you can't meet in God's house. Listen, they're after the church today. And we've been doing this long enough. It's time to come up swinging. I don't care if there are more of us. We have David as an example. We have Daniel as an example. We have Joshua as an example. We have Gideon as an example. Remember what happened with Gideon when God called him to face the Midianites? He was doing rope-a-dope in the wine press. He was threshing wheat in the wine press. He wasn't threshing wheat on the top of the hill where the threshing floor would be located because the winds are higher on the top of a hill. He was down in the valley in the wine press hiding, hoping the Midianites wouldn't see him. And what did the Lord say to him? Go, you mighty man of valor. Mighty men of valor, in my mind, don't thresh wheat in the wine press. Uh, Hey, there was, how about that for a Freudian slip? I said the wine press. <laughs> but you know what happened? There was an army of some 30,000 against the massive army of the Midianites. And God said, can't work with it. It's too many. So he said, hey, tell them to go down there and, and drink water. Whoever lifts it up and makes a cup with their hand or laps it, that's how you'll divide the army. Got down to some... Uh, 10,000 people. And then what happened after that? How many, does anybody know how many were actually in Gideon's army when they fought the Midianites? 300. God said, now that's something I can work with. Well, listen, there's not many of us, but we're something God can work with. 
because it's his power and it's he who deserves the glory. We got to stand up. We have to stand up for life. We have to stand up for family. We have to stand up for genders. We have to stand up for human sexuality. We have to stand up for the things that matter to God. And God is wanting the men to lead the charge. Is anybody in? I say we do it. Because this is what we're all about. Now, some of us are taller than others. Some of us have a bigger circumference than others. Some of us may be more cranial than others. Some of us may be more feminine than others. But we're all men, and God wants to use us all. Amen. 